This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Uh, my name is Philip Murphy, I'm the director here, and welcome to the third in our series of uh, seminars celebrating the Diamond Jubilee, uh, looking at the Queen's relationship with the Commonwealth uh, in a number of different respects. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking uh, our senior research fellow, Stuart Merle, uh, for organising this, this series of, of seminars and for all the work that he's put into this. For our, to our events team, uh, Olga and Chloe, for all the hard work they put into this and, and every other event. And, and to my co-panelist, Sue Onslow, uh, from the London School of Economics, currently, but whom we'll hopefully soon be welcoming to uh, the Institute uh, as, a, as a member of staff, which will be wonderful for us. Um, uh, but uh, I'm going to keep the introductions far shorter than they should be, because we, uh, we, have, we have limited time. But let me, let me simply say um, that on my, on my left we have uh, Sir Sridhar Ramphal, who's simply one of the most significant figures in international affairs in the last half century. Um, born in Guyana, uh, we're proud to claim him as a graduate of this university. Um, King's College, as well as uh, Harvard, of course. Um, he was independent Guyana's first Attorney General and later uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Justice. And of course, of course, he was the Commonwealth's second Secretary General, the first from a developing country, serving three terms from 1975 to 1990, a period we're about to explore uh, in greater detail in the seminar. He served on a number of groundbreaking international commissions, including the Brand Commission on International Development and the Palm Commission on Disarmament and Security Issues. He's Chancellor of the University of Warwick, University of West Indies, was, and I, I could go on, but I, I will stop. Um, uh, on my right, I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce uh, Hugo Vickers, uh, an extraordinarily prolific author and broadcaster who's written extensively about the world family, and most famously has uh, <coughs> written uh, the wonderful authorised biography of the, of the Queen Mother. Ah, what Unauthorized. was it? Unauthorised. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to explain the, the difference. <laughs> um, right. Um, uh, and his subjects have um, <coughs> included figures who've been close to the Royal Family. My particular favourite is the wonderful work he did uh, editing the diaries of Cecil Beaton, um, my, uh, <coughs> including the volume irresistibly titled The Unexpurgated uh, Beaton Diaries. Um, and he's, he's um, uh, rare to be able to introduce someone who you, whose work you'll encounter every day on the streets of London, uh, as well as on your bookshelves. He was the chairman of the Jubilee Walkway Trust. Uh, mm -hmm. from October 2002, and uh, you can see his, his creations as you, as you wander around the capital. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce both. We have a long series of questions, and we probably get through about a fraction of them. Um, but let me, uh, let me start um, by going through some of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meetings uh, that you were involved with. Uh, Sunny and the Queen's role in them. We start in in 1977. Um, it's a good starting point because this was the chogum that coincided with the Silver Jubilee. Uh, took place in London, um, apparently at the proposal of the of the Queen. Um, what are your recollections of it and of the planning process for it? Well. First of all, what a joy it is to be among all of you uh, who are part of my past. Uh, <laughs> 19, 1977 was, of course, my first 
uh, head of government. I, I never liked the acronym Chogham, I must tell you. Um, so it was my first Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Uh, and so I was brand new. Well, I was brand new in a, com in a secretariat sense. Uh, I had already had close contacts with the Commonwealth. But it was my first meeting and it was, <laughs> it turned out to be quite challenging. But first of all, let me answer the question about the connection with the Jubilee. It may have been inspired by the Queen, but of course it, it had to be proposed by the Prime Minister. It was uh, Harold Wilson. And there had not been a heads of government meeting in London for many years. You remember the, there was a big break, and an important psychological break, uh, from hosting the Commonwealth meetings in London. And it began going around the, the, the Commonwealth. But at Jamaica, which was the meeting at which I was elected, Harold Wilson proposed that the Santa Sun meeting be held in London. And he put it on the ground that this was a rather special year for Britain uh, and its connection with the Commonwealth. It was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Uh, and that, of course, was the selling point. Uh, it took it out of the rotation uh, of a meeting in Britain and meeting in Britain again. And heads were very happy uh, with the conjuncture. And that's how we came uh, to be in Britain. Uh, of course, it, it turned out to be uh, a very important time uh, for a whole variety of reasons which we'll, we'll come to. Uh, but that, that was the origins of it. Um, the government recently released some files under the Freedom of Information Act about the arrangements, and one of the, one of the big fears was that uh, President Idi Amin of Uganda would make a, an unscheduled uh, appearance. <laughs> you, um, is that very much on your mind? It, it was very much on my mind. <laughs> then, um, I, had the, I had done the right thing, when, as I saw it, when I came to off. I went to Kampala. And, and called on Amin. Uh, that's another story because he, he took me up in a helicopter which he piloted. <laughs> and I, I thought this was a little beyond the call of duty. <laughs> what do you do? But it was worse than that because he, he invited me to come with him and, and my wife uh, to come with him to open a game farm. And as I understood it, to open a, a new game farm, which was a big enterprise, uh, and it was well outside Kampala, which was why we went in the helicopter. When I got to the place, uh, I found the whole diplomatic corps. <laughs> and I remember the German ambassador, I, I, I greeted him, and uh, he was rather surly. And I said, you, you, don't, you don't look very happy. He said, well, no, because, you know, this is the sixth time in the last eight months that we've opened this game park. <laughs> <laughs> and what is more, you came in a helicopter, we have to drive. <laughs> so, you know, this was, I mean... <laughs> uh, I knew nothing about it, but there it is. We opened the game park and we, we got safely back <laughs> to Kampala. But the problem in Santa Seven was how were we going to deal with Amin in London? By then, his atrocities had mounted. Uh, the British Parliament would have liked to have seen him out of the Commonwealth, and they certainly did not want to see him on British soil, which was a bit of a turnaround, no? but not unfamiliar in British politics, <laughs> because the first capital that welcomed Amin after the coup was Britain, was London. 
Edward Heath invited him to Downing Street. Now, the British conveniently forgot all about that uh, as things unfolded. And Callaghan was under great pressure to give an assurance that Amin would not attend the heads of government meeting in London. Well, Amin was equal to the task. He, he made it quite clear to the British government and to me that he was, he was going to attend. What is more, as I've been reminded just now from my steward, uh, he, he threatened to come with 200 dancers. <laughs> because he wasn't coming to Callaghan, he was coming to his queen, who had been his commander-in-chief. You know, he, he played all, all the notes. And um, <laughs> meantime, I was having a dialogue with the British Prime Minister. And Jim Callaghan was absolutely insistent with me that there was no way in which Amin was going to come. And I had to be equally insistent that he could not not invite him. That the meet, he, Britain had asked for the meeting. It's a meeting of Commonwealth heads of government. Uganda was in the corner. Uh, he could not take it upon himself to say that Amin was not welcome. I understood why he was not welcome. Callaghan was in quite a state because he thought it could reach a stage where he was so criticized in Parliament for allowing this that it threatened the government. So, you know, I couldn't just be aloof and, and take a, uh, a protocol position. I had to understand it. So I had to say to him, Look, I am going to try to ensure that he doesn't. At that stage, I fell short of saying, you know, I can undertake that he wouldn't, because I couldn't. Um, and so we played this minuet for a while, uh, with Callahan becoming more insistent. Uh, and my beginning the dialogue with Kampala, that it would perhaps be better, uh, you know, if a major incident was provoked in the Commonwealth by your coming, and so on. But uh, Amin was not <laughs> amused by that at all. Uh, he insisted on his right to attend right up to the very end. But by then, I believed that the weight of opinion mine and all the rest that he was receiving, and I invoked the help of other leaders, particularly Commonwealth leaders, African leaders, to say, look, on balance, it might be better if you didn't come. Uh, and I felt that he was not going to come. And I conveyed this to Callahan and said, look, we, we are going to be on a tripwire, but I think you're okay. He's not going to come. But don't say that he can't come. Because maybe that will precipitate his coming. <laughs> well, Jim Callahan wore that advice right up to the very end. When two days before the meeting, Amin staged a, a kind of PR slump at which he was a master. Jim Gallagher called me and said, have you heard the news? Well, of course, I hadn't, he had. The, the wire services had begun to put out a story that Amin was in an airplane over Ireland. <laughs> I'm sure there are some of you here who <laughs> will remember that. And Jim Callahan said, he's not going to be allowed to land, Sonny. I don't care what you tell me. He is not going to be allowed to land. I said, look, we don't know for sure that this, I was groping, you know. We don't know for sure that this thing is true. We, all, all we've got is this report. Where does it come from? And I was buying time. 
And of course, as it turned out, the whole thing was a hoax. <laughs> he was not in any airplane over Ireland, but he had allowed us to get into the media who were puppets in his hand. They, they knew he was playing them, but he was irresistible. They, they, he knew they were maneuvering, but they couldn't do anything about it. So, the story had got some authenticity as it was received by the British. Anyway, uh, they tracked it down, it turned out, no, he was not in an airplane. <laughs> and he didn't come. You know, all went well to that extent. Do you know the story about Mountbatten and the Queen? Lord, Lord Mountbatten said, that, said to the Queen after the St Paul's Cathedral service that he thought she looked very cross. And she said, well, I was just thinking how awful it would be if Armin suddenly turned up and gate crashed the service after all. <laughs> so Lord Mountbatten then said, well, what would you have done? And she said, I would have picked up the... The, 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 city of Pearl, the city of London, Pearl Salt, and hit him over the head with <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's move on to the next uh, Hexagon meeting soon. Which was Lusaka in 1970. <coughs> of course, Rhodesia was the contentious issue in the build-up to that, um, with the debate about whether there should be an all-party conference uh, to discuss uh, Rhodesia Zimbabwe's future. But what are your memories in the run-up and the background to this? Because... Uh, Robert Muldoon, who was the Prime Minister of New Zealand, paid, of course, a visit to London and openly expressed his profound misgivings that the Queen should attend uh, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Lusaka, followed by Mrs Thatcher, who appeared to echo this. And uh, Mrs Thatcher herself certainly landed in Lusaka with a great deal of trepidation, wearing dark glasses because she feared that acid might be thrown in her face. Um, I'm just repeating what Peter Carrington has described. But um, what is your recollection of the Queen's approach to whether she should attend Lusaka or not? Well, it's, it's very clear. It's not contractual. Um, remember New Zealanders used to call Muldoon Piggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sobriquet I never quarreled with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Piggy Muldoon was of course dead against what we were trying to do in Rhodesia. Uh, many New Zealanders had taken up residence in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and he did not want a confrontation between the Commonwealth and uh, Ian Smith and all that. And, involving New Zealand. So his, his tactic in relation to the meeting was that there were open hostilities uh, within Zimbabwe. There was uh, a raid from South Africa, uh, a, bomb, a bombing uh, mission of Lusaka. Uh, don't forget uh, Joshua Nkomo was residing in the grounds of State House. So he very much a target. And Muldoon's tactic was, I do not wish to expose my sovereign to the hostilities that might become even more confrontational and pose a danger to her if she went to Lusaka. It's a very plausible kind of almost patriotic sentiment. But behind it lay this desire to prevent the Queen from going to Lusaka. Uh, and there was, there was more to it than that. But let's just take that uh, objection. How was I going to deal uh, with this threat? knowing that this was music to Margaret Thatcher's ears because she did not want the Queen uh, to go to Lusaka. Yeah. Things were reaching ahead uh, where it was quite clear that the Queen's influence at Lusaka 
was not one whose script would have been written in Downing Street. So it, it, it was a kind of twosome between Muldoon and Mrs. Thatcher, uh, who seized on it uh, and said, well, she had her reservations too. Now, one of the things I tried to do was to deal with this argument that the Queen was in danger. Because it wasn't an argument you could brush aside when you had the reality of bombing taking place in Lusaka. So I got Joshua, uh, and it, remember at, at that point, it was Joshua's party that was leading it uh, in, in, in the struggle, to issue a unilateral statement. In effect, accepting a ceasefire over the period of the Commonwealth Conference. It was a unilateral declaration that they would not, the Patriotic Front would not, uh, during this period, uh, engage in any hostility <coughs> that could disturb the environment of the conference. I then invited Muzarev, who was in fact, you know, Ian Smith's favorite uh, nationalist, uh, to equal that statement. Here was the Patrick Front saying this. You now, if Muzarev would add his voice to that, then there would be an almost irresistible uh, <coughs> condition that all would be well. And he did. I, it was irresistible. And so I felt I had laid the background for saying, this is not a real threat. Look, this is what these people have said. This is going to be a time of ceasefire and, and so on. Uh, but that did not end the matter, uh, because Mrs. Thatcher and Muldoon, you know, still entertained their, uh, their wish. What clinched it was the Green, uh, who made it absolutely clear through her private office <coughs> in talking with uh, the media that she was going to the Lusaka conference. And uh, it was then almost impossible for Mrs. Thatcher to, to, to pursue uh, her uncertainties. But I had done, I had done what I thought was the even more necessary thing. I had tried to ensure that whatever were Mrs. Thatcher's misgivings, and I knew them very well, that Lusaka was going to be a conference in which the African leadership were going to consciously adopt a non-confrontational attitude, even on the questions of Southern Africa. Um, how important do you think was the Queen's presence actually at the Lusaka meeting in ensuring that there was um, an amicable outcome? Well, I think it was very, it was very important uh, because, first of all, it, it ensured a calming mm -hmm. of Mrs. Thatcher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 because here was the Queen making it very clear. Secondly, the Queen's posture at Lusaka, in which she was clearly in a good relationship with the African leadership, uh, I mean the relationship between President Cameron and herself, the dance, the famous dance that took to place in the State House, all of that created an environment uh, to which the Queen contributed very significantly and consciously. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, the reception of the Queen in Zambia, where, as is always the case, when the Queen has traveled in the Commonwealth, and not just in the white Commonwealth, uh, but in Africa, she's a star. She was a celebrity. She was received with great warmth uh, in Zambia. And, um, and all of that created an environment that ultimately helped us to get the Lusaka Accord. Thank you very much. Let, should, should we move on to NASA? And, and because we, since we're talking about Southern, Southern Africa and Mrs. Thatcher, and Sue, do you want to? Yes, I mean, following up again at NASA, you, you've commented before that if the Queen hadn't been there, we might have been on the rocks. Mrs. Thatcher became an aberration <laughs> and um, <laughs> didn't care. So again, was the Queen's presence a vital bridging factor? And in what way did she contribute to easing the tensions that existed in the Commonwealth on sanctions towards South Africa? Well, in much the same way, of course, by now the issue had, had come down to sanctions and Mrs. Thatcher's insistence uh, and, and quite happy insistence that even if she was a minority of one, Britain was not going to have sanctions against her and, and all that. What was very important to me was that not just Africa, but the rest of the Commonwealth, starting with the Queen, and then the Prime Ministers of the white countries, Canada, Australia in particular, I know I couldn't rely uh, on, on New Zealand, uh, should be seen to be with the frontline states, to be with Africa, to be for sanctions. And of course, I had there Brian Mulroney of Canada, who subsequently became a bad word in Canada. But he was very, very good on apartheid and in the Commonwealth. Um, and Bob Hawke, who had inherited the Labour Party leadership in Australia, and who was very strong, very positive uh, on the sanctions issue. And then beyond that, we had Rajiv. Um, so, uh, quite apart from the African leadership, we had the rest of the common, and then we had the Queen. The Queen who, without any formal statement, uh, just through what was made known about her attitude uh, towards, not necessarily towards sanctions, but towards resolving the South Africa problem and getting rid of this thorn in the flesh of the Commonwealth uh, was aligning herself with the great majority who were then being opposed only by the British Prime Minister. So the Queen's presence in, in Nassau was terribly important and the Queen's <coughs> role after Nassau, pursuant to Nassau, was even more important. Did the issue of the creation of the Eminence, Eminent Persons Group uh, come up during the Queen's dinner uh, before, uh, on the night before the review meeting? Do you, do you recall that? No, I, I think we're getting a little mixed up. The, the idea of the Eminent Persons was a contribution sparked by Bob Hawke at NASA. And it was one of the decisions of the Nassau meeting, that there should be an eminent persons group that would go to South Africa, engage the South African government and uh, the local leadership and so on. That was a complete break with the past. It was a break for the Commonwealth, who had pursued uh, a strategy of isolation of South Africa. Uh, the last thing you would expect the Commonwealth to be doing was engaging with their apartheid government. So it was, it was a completely new and bold idea. Um, let me interpose here. I remember when 
we came back to London uh, and this, this of course was the hot item that the colonel was going to send an EPG to South Africa. Um, Trevor Huddleston, who was, you remember, fiery, Trevor Huddleston, Father Huddleston, leading the anti-apartheid movement, and very close to me, shook his finger at me and said, Sonny, you're doing a very dangerous thing. I'm going to go along with it, but I must tell you, I'm going to condemn you if it fails. <laughs> well, <laughs> for me, that was fair enough. I, I, I knew where his heart was, and I said, it's, it's a big chance you're taking. But it could lead to the breakthrough we need. <coughs> and he, he, he went along afterwards. But the Queen let it be known in Nassau that she was for the idea uh, of an eminent persons group, for this new approach. Uh, and it was an approach, of course, that Mrs. Thatcher could not really resist, because this was consistent with her policy that we must talk to the South Africa. What she tried to do was to hijack the eminent persons group by proposing to me, because it was left to me in consultation with leaders to appoint the group, to propose Jeffrey Howard, the British Foreign Secretary. And I, I had to argue with her. You know, as courteous today as you have to argue with every Prime Minister that this was not on. Uh, the eminent person who could not contain official representatives of any member country, not just Jeffrey Howard, who I happen to like uh, and was very conciliatory in many respects, but he would be representing the British government and therefore our position. And we got around that. He did. Um, so I'd just like to, to, to ask, um, you emphasize very much the presence, the importance of the presence of the Queen at each of these common yep. heads of government meetings. Um, after she had missed Singapore back in 1971 on the recommendations of Prime Minister Heath, do you want to comment on the importance of her continued presence at these meetings as head of the Commonwealth, as a vital adjunct then to not just her position and her authority, but also to the proceedings and outcomes? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a big question, because we must assume an environment without the topstone kind of issue of apartheid and all of that. So it's her role and influence in a wider context. Uh, and I would say it is enormously important. It is important for the same reason that her being head of the Commonwealth is important. Remember the 1949 Declaration. We accept the king then as the symbol of our free association, of the free association of our nations. And as such, as such, the head of the Commonwealth. That is important to the Commonwealth. It is important to Britain's membership of the Commonwealth. <coughs> and, of course, the, the transference to that from the old concept of allegiance is what has made the Commonwealth possible. So her continuing presence in that role is, I think, vital to the survival of the Commonwealth and to the environment in which the Commonwealth does business. <coughs> and she uses that presence very delicately, but very positively. Can, can I ask you a follow-up to that? I mean, in the Commonwealth realms, it's very clear in, <coughs> in domestic matters, uh, the Prime Minister advises the Queen uh, in her role as, as, as sovereign. 
There is a grey zone about who advises the Queen in her capacity as head of the Commonwealth. Um, and you said uh, before that <coughs> the Commonwealth Secretary General comes closest, I suspect, to being the channel of communication to the Queen on Commonwealth affairs and the exercise of influence on her in these matters. And I, you, you want to expand? I on stand by that. Right. I stand by that. But it's called constitutionally a little bit controversial. And it is, it is right that it be constitutionally a grey area. <laughs> there are some matters of constitutional importance that should be in the grey zone. <laughs> uh, but I think that the statement in its substance is correct. That it is not the British Prime Minister who in, in a crunch situation is the Queen's advisor. In that Trump situation, the Queen has, in my experience, turned to the Secretary General uh, for his opinion, for his reading of Commonwealth opinion, for guidance from his point of view. Uh, and not only the Queen, but I think we all have to remember that when we talk of the Queen in re relation to the Commonwealth, we have to remember the very, very important role played by her private office, by her private secretaries, by the briefings she gets from them on Commonwealth issues, Commonwealth affairs, and the guidance she quite properly gets from them quite apart, uh, and they are acting quite independently of Downing Street or the Foreign Office. Um, in terms of then acting independently, as you say, of Downing Street and the Foreign Office, um, during your time as Secretary General um, of the Commonwealth, the responsibility for drafting the Queen's Commonwealth Day message seems to have rested with the Royal Commonwealth Society. Uh, is that true, or did your secretariat have an important input into this? It, 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 it is essentially true. Um, but, there were, but not just the Royal Commonwealth Society. Uh, I believe in their own discussions, mm -hmm. they would have involved others like the Royal Overseas League and so on. But not the Secretariat, Secretary General or the Secretariat. And I saw no problem with that. Of course, I had an interest in what the Queen's message was. And it was for me, through my channels, to convey to those who were drafting the, the draft that went to the palace, to have those messages conveyed. And they always were. So it was a perfect relationship. I. The Secretariat did not draft the Queen's Christmas message. That was drafted independently by others. But I was in a position to, if not ensure, at least inform in a very positive way the can, content of the message. Can I ask you about a specific example? When she came back from uh, the 1983 uh, children, uh, in, in Delhi. She gave a Christmas Day message talking about the gap between rich and poor in the world, which, which didn't go down terribly well with a lot of conservative backbenchers. <laughs> and um, W. David McIntyre said he could detect in some of the phrases your alliterative style. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it would have been, it, it was a very important message at a very important time in North-South relations and the international dialogue. And uh, it certainly reflected uh, my sentiments. Uh, since I didn't draft it, he is wrong in saying that I had my stand. In terms of um, multi-faith <coughs> observance within the Commonwealth, did it evolve <coughs> in significant ways during your time as Secretary General? And I wondered whether you were aware of any opposition within sections of the Church of England to the multi-faith element within the Commonwealth. 
after all, that potentially could put the Queen in an invidious position as being head of the Church of England, but also head of the Commonwealth. I was not uh, aware of those hostilities. Uh, the multi-faith service did evolve d during my time, but it had begun before my time. So I was not there at the inception when these issues would have been uh, much to the fore. It doesn't surprise me that they might have been. Uh, you know, the ecumenical movement was in its early days and evolving. Uh, but I attached a great deal of importance to the multi-faith part of the, the Commonwealth ceremony. And it is very greatly to the Queen's credit uh, that she would have encouraged that development. I mean, there's, there's a final question which I can't help but, but, but um, ask, just wrapping up this part of the discussion. The headship, of course, is not hereditary. Um, what are your own views about what should happen to it at the end of the current reign? Well, my own view is that nothing should happen to it. That this matter was settled in 1949 when the king, or whoever succeeded the king, as uh, in due course it was decreed, uh, that the, 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 the sovereign in Britain would continue to be the symbol of the free association of the member states. It should not be made an issue, in my view. There should be a seamless transition to whoever succeeds the Queen as head of state in the United Kingdom. And how, had, had I existed in perpetuity, <laughs> <laughs> it is the approach I will take. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I'd like to um, invite Hugo Vickers to, to comment. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by everything you say. I've only got a few tiny little points. One of things which I'm sure you know, um, one of the very first discussions in Cabinet, the moment the King died, was what the Queen was going to be called in relation to the Commonwealth. And it was actually that, at that point in February 1952 that she became head of the Commonwealth, um, which is, I think, very interesting. And they, and they made a number of adjustments to her styles and titles so as not to offend. Yeah, but, but that was because it had been settled in yes. the line. Yes. They stuck with the form yeah. of the style and title as adopted in line. Which is which is For our father. Yes, yes. Yeah. And as you know, of course, then um, you were talking about you know her important role. I mean, the, the, the famous time when she went to Ghana in 1961, um, the House of Commons again probably for very reason, very reasonably were, were frightened because Nkrumah was in trouble and there were bombs going off and things about the safety of the Queen, and they felt the need to say this. Macmillan, it was mm. his job was to advise her. And, um, and he actually made, I think, a fair point that the Queen is always in considerable danger when she travels, particularly when she travels in, um, in the country areas. Uh, you know, this, there can always be a, be a danger, but it became a sort of very big political issue, and she was absolutely determined to go. And he made a very interesting point in his diaries when he said she is not going to be treated like a mascot or a film star. She is determined to be, you know, I mean, rather like Elizabeth I, she had the sort of heart and side of a man, you know, she was going to do it. And of course, as a result of which, wonderfully, Ghana stays in the Commonwealth. The, the other thing she, she told, her, I'm sure you know the story as well, but she told her sister-in-law, um, Princess Sophie of Hanover, that whenever she goes to these meetings, she says, she, she says, I feel like a doctor. I see four prime ministers in the morning and four in the afternoon, and they all tell me their problems. Which I think is good. And the other thing on the faith issue, which was interesting, was, I don't know if you know this, but Churchill in 1952, when she was proposing to go on that Commonwealth tour, and she was going to go to Salon, as it then was, um, informed them that if she was to go to Candia, to the Temple of the Tooth, she was not, he was not having her removing her shoes 
and stockings because this might upset her Christian subjects. This went <laughs> on for two years. I mean, they, they were going to put on, is it called a para, parahara, what was it called? And anyway, their wonderful elephant, like a derbar, so elephant procession. And so then they said, well, we will cancel the visit. And then the prime minister tried to cancel the whole visit. And on it went. And, uh, and eventually, uh, various officials from the Temple of the Tooth came and said, we would like the Queen to come. And eventually, um, Lord Swinton consulted Lord Salisbury, who said, it's actually very much like taking your hat off when you go to church. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact is, I've never seen that story published anywhere, <laughs> except by me. And um, <laughs> it, sort of, it just shows the sort of things that were going on. Those are just my little comments. But, um, you see why you have to buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> you said something that maybe I should make a comment on. One of the most important roles the Queen <coughs> plays in relation to Commonwealth leaders and therefore in relation to the Commonwealth is precisely that opportunity for interaction that she talked about four in the morning, four now. Yes. These are, they're no longer called audiences. These are conversations the Queen has with every single Commonwealth head of government in the course of <coughs> the Commonwealth heads of government meeting. And you see, you're at the meeting, you will notice heads of government very quietly slipping away when the, their appointed time has arrived. <laughs> Uh, and disappearing from the conference for half an hour. Because he's going to spend about 20 minutes or so with the Queen. Talking about their countries. Talking about their problems. And talking to someone who is conversant with their problems. And who exudes an attitude of caring about them and their problems beyond Britain, beyond the Commonwealth. And I have seen the most radical of Commonwealth heads of government <coughs> who you would, outside of that situation, describe as almost certainly anti monarch attach immense importance <laughs> to that moment. Great, and they all keep to it, they slip away, they have those conversations, which of course is immensely important for the cohesion of the Commonwealth and immensely important to the Queen to be hearing from the Prime Minister or the President directly, you know, what's happening in Tanzania and how he sees things and what the Commonwealth can do, and what Britain can do sometimes. Yes. Um, I, I Following up on that, on um, problems that heads of state can have, I just would like to ask you on two particular instances, one of which is the topic of Grenada in 1983, and the second is 1987, the, the two coups that took place in Fiji. Now, those were troubles within Commonwealth realms, and um, um, I'm, do you recall what happened on the question of the Queen's stance on the attitude of the American invasion by an ally of, let's face it, sovereign territory. Um, in Fiji, there was the position of the Queen's representative, the Governor General, uh, Ratu Sukhanaya. Um, and uh, I'd be very grateful if you could share your reminiscences. Well, on, on, on Grenada, uh, the Queen, fortunately, was taking the same position uh, as the Prime Minister. Although the Prime Minister's position was more uh, overt, uh, she had a covert uh, position uh, with Reagan, which was much more friendly about it. But her official position was that how dare the Americans uh, invade a Commonwealth country, uh, and, and a country of which the Queen was head of state. Uh, Although we now know from the telegrams that passed between herself and Reagan over Grenada that it was, well, Ronnie and, and, and Maggie. <laughs> 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 but 
But the Queen's formal position was her position. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, had no other side to it. Mm -hmm. That this was a Commonwealth country. This was one of her realms. I suppose what slightly muddied the water was the suggestion that her representative, Sir Paul Schoon, had actually called in the troops. Well, <laughs> uh, that is the story as vouchsafed by Sir Paul School. <laughs> but there is more than enough evidence that the letter conveying this request mm. and authority was written well after the invasion mm. on board a United States ship <laughs> off <laughs> Grenada. Uh, I have no question in my mind that that is what happened. Um, so he provided the cover, but he, was, he felt safe in doing it because there were colonial Caribbean prime ministers who were fomenting the American invasion. Thank God, not all of them, but enough of them uh, to give the Americans uh, the spunks to do this terrible thing. But on the, the question of the coups in Fiji in 1987, it, the record seems to suggest the palace was taking a rather different line from that of the British government. Yes, because the, the relationship of the Governor General uh, was very much one to the Queen. Uh, and the, the, you, if you, you remember, there were efforts to see the Queen, to have conversations with the palace apart from the British government. Uh, and the, the British government took a, the, the palace took a very strong position in relation to the Fijian coup uh, and, and made the Queen's position an opposition. Uh, to the Governor General's position, very clear. Mm -hmm. So she exercised a positive influence uh, in relation to the Fiji situation. So can we then say that she's instrumental to Fiji leaving the Commonwealth after the Second Coup? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, if you put it in terms of Fiji leaving the Commonwealth being the necessary implication of the correct action that she took, I would accept that. Let me now open uh, it up to the, the floor for, for questions. Can I simply ask you, um, firstly, to identify yourselves, because there, there is a, a, a recording of this, although we won't see your, your faces. And secondly, to keep your comments or questions <coughs> as short as, as possible and as clear as possible. Thank you. Yes, Philip. Prime uh, teacher and uh, soon to be ex of London Metropolitan University. Um, Sonny, I just want to ask you when did you meet um, Robert Mugabe? Uh, what did you make of him then? And do you think he's changed since? <laughs> well, to, to respond to the last part, do you think he's changed? It's always difficult to know whether the persona into which one has changed was there all the time and is now only manifest. So it's a difficult question to answer. If I were to answer it in a more simplistic way, I would say, yes, he has. Uh, Robert Mugabe is, a, is an extremely complex uh, personality. <laughs> when I first met him, of course, he was the head of Zana. Uh, he was not a the, the, the familiar figure on the African scene that Joshua was. Uh, he was a quieter, more thoughtful, more introspective uh, individual, uh, but much more of a nationalist and a radical. Uh, 
Joshua, you know, was never unacceptable to the British government. Robert Mugabe always was. Uh, and that was because of the depth of his Marxist background um, and, and his connections, uh, particularly with China. Now, that was the Robert Mugabe of the early days. Uh, <clears throat> I remember here in London during the Lancaster House meetings when Peter Carrington had them over a barrel during the day and I tried to undo the damage during the night. <laughs> I met with Joshua and more importantly with Robert Mugabe almost every night of the period of the Lancaster House meeting in their, in their apartments. Um, and I remember saying to him once, you know, when this is all over, are you prepared for the role Zimbabwe has to play on the international scene in relation to North-South issues, in relation to development, uh, in relation to what was then the catchphrase, the new international economic order. And he said, Secretary General, he was, he was always more formal than Joshua, who would say sorry, uh, no. In those years, when I should have been becoming familiar with those issues, I was in prison. And it, 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 it had an impact on me. Uh, and I realized how true it was. Uh, and I said, well, you know, part of our job when it is over is that we must be by your side to help you. Of course, when it was over, he chose the British government to be by his side. Yes, please. I'm Anthony Elman, uh, ex-member, employee of the Commonwealth Secretariat during Sunday's day. Um, when I bring the discussion closer to the present time, I think many of many admirers and lovers of the Commonwealth are disturbed, to, to put it mildly, by the <coughs> decision that the heads of government meeting in Perth to hold the next meeting in Sri Lanka, despite the allegations of human rights abuses uh, involving even the entourage of the president. Would you imagine that the Queen is entirely comfortable with this development? And do you think it would have happened under your watch? <laughs> well, to answer you directly, I don't think it would have happened under my watch. Uh, because I had a very uh, positive approach to the location of a Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. I thought that it should be used, and as far as possible used by the Secretariat, by the Secretary General, in terms of where, as the venue of the next meeting, would best serve the interests of the Commonwealth. For example, after the tempestuous uh, 1971 meeting in Singapore, I wasn't even Secretary General at the time, I encouraged the Canadians, Trudeau, who was an agnostic over the government, to hold the meeting in Canada, to hold the meeting in Ottawa, because through my interaction with them as foreign minister guy, uh, and with Ivan Head, who ran his private office, he had my views <laughs> about what and how the heads of government meeting should operate. Singapore was a bad heads of government meeting, although Singapore was a wonderful venue. Trudeau understood the importance 
of a heads of government meeting being a meeting of minds, not a, a set piece for the presentation of speeches, and so on. And I thought that influence was very important for the future of the Commonwealth. Now, it's for reasons like that that I think you should influence the venue of the next meeting. What, what cause were you on, sir? Which capital or which prime minister as chairman uh, would best serve those? What? It means, too, that the decision should not be taken too far ahead. And that, I think, would be a mistake. It's a mistake that has already been made. The decision to hold a meeting in Kampala was taken, I think, three years before. That is wrong. Leave the, the, the venue as much as possible for as long as you can. Politics changes, prime ministers changes, you don't know what is the situation at the time. And to some extent, this is what has happened in Sri Lanka. More questions? Yeah, I thought they were entire. <laughs> to, to come back to the monarchy. Um, a fledgling Commonwealth, from my point of view, had the phenomenon of a head imposed on it. And we are living with it. And today a former Secretary General says, it's there and it should stay. But what is it about the Commonwealth amongst international organizations that makes it so different that it needs a head? Um, I can see problems if the head didn't come historically the way that it did, because the, uh, you just transferred the phenomenon of a monarchy uh, that some of these states then had. But why does the Commonwealth need a head? And if it isn't necessary, really, except in the context of the history so far, why need it continue in perpetuity, no matter who becomes the monarch of Britain? Well, let me start where you started that the Commonwealth had a monarch impose the it. I can't accept that. The king was not imposed of the Commonwealth in 1949. Nehru came to the heads of the government meeting, only really seven or nine of them, and said, we are going to become a republic. India is free, and it is going to become a republic. We cannot accept allegiance to the British monarch. But we want to stay in the Commonwealth. We, we very much want the Commonwealth to continue. And the heads of the government, if you like, the king, because I'm sure the king was consulted over this, accepted the abandonment of the concept of allegiance as a criteria of membership. And Nero said, we are quite prepared to accept uh, the king in, in a symbolic role as the symbol of our free association. And as such, have the common. It was a very dexterous process, a very wise process, and a wonderful piece of political draftsmanship. And we are the inheritors of that. So to talk about imposing the king on the commonwealth is, I think, perhaps not fair to history. Now you ask, I suppose, a more general question. Why does the commonwealth as an organization need a head? Well, I would say, what harm does the head do? It is always good to have a symbol of unity outside of the contentiousness of membership, especially a head that can present that image of a dispassionate, 
but caring element of unity. And uh, I think the Queen has been good for the Commonwealth in many of the ways that I have attempted to describe. And I think that influence wisely used, used in a caring fashion, would be good for the future of the Commonwealth. Um, Sonny, if I could follow up on that. So you don't feel then the rise of Republican sentiment within some of the major realms of the, com of the Commonwealth. I mean, we're obviously all very aware of the current plans for Jamaica to become a republic. You don't see that as in any way as a threat to the cohesion of the Commonwealth? Absolutely not. There are more republics in the Commonwealth than there are monarchical systems. I don't think the Queen loses any sleep at all <laughs> over the fact that Jamaica, or for that matter Australia, were to go the Republican route. Australia will remain a member of the Commonwealth, of which she is head. I suppose the, the problem is that the palace has never minded a clean break, so long as it's done constitutionally. The problem is a slow process of a kind of erosion of yeah. prestige. And you, you became Secretary General in the wake of Gough Whitlam's dismissal by the Governor General, which, which fueled you know, the rise of republicanism in Australia. And it, it kind of rumbles on in the background. It well, you can, and you can understand, because that draws the palace, yeah. it draws the Queen into a domestic debate, which she'd much rather do without. Yeah. Um, come on, make up your minds. You, yeah. you, you want to become a republic, or you want to stay with the present situation? But you know, either way, it's okay by me. I think that's the, the palace attitude. <laughs> you know, you, she's not losing any sleep, you said. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all. Do you think, in, in, a, in a Trudeau period, if Canada had opted to be a republic, the palace would lose any sleep over that? Not at all. I, I, I lived in Canada for a number of years, and we were all fascinated by Trudeau, whether we liked him or not. Mm -hmm. Were you? I remember seeing a picture of you I, by Kai Chua Fall with a pack of cigarettes behind your back. What <laughs> <laughs> behind my back? Pack of cigarettes. <laughs> I love that. You I, were, uh, I, I know the picture. I, I know the picture, but I know the hand behind my back. You were Trudeau. I thought Trudeau, Trudeau was absolutely wonderful. I thought he was one of the greatest statesmen the Commonwealth ever had. But there was always a, there was always a suggestion that the palace, some people in the palace felt he wasn't quite deferential enough, that the protocol matters weren't always uh, that's spot among, on. That's among the reasons why I said he was one of them. <laughs> 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 not, not many would slide down a balance at Lancaster. <laughs> but he, he brought intellect, intelligence, to Commonwealth Affairs. He once said to me, you know, if the heads of government meeting was the only thing about the Commonwealth, just this one event every two years, when I can talk with colleagues and have them talk with me, and we get into each other's minds, that would make the Commonwealth worthwhile. That was the depth of his intellectual approach to the Commonwealth. We need more truth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, I, I'd like to ask um, the SG, as we used to call you, um, what do you think now of the current uh, heads of government meeting? Because the meetings you talk about, when we began, five, six days, there was time for them to get to know each other, there was time for them to go and talk to now, it's Friday, there's that uh, grandiose opening ceremony, which takes up the whole of the morning. They have a short meeting Friday afternoon. They go on what is called a retreat, but it's not really a retreat. They have breakfast with the Commonwealth Games Federation. Uh, they are badgered by um, people's, you know, um, NGOs statement, and they have a children's um, forum, and, they have to meet the little children, and they're over by midday Sunday. I don't think they meet the Queen anymore, but but I think it has helped to um, destroy that that camaraderie um, and and friendship which developed 
in the days when, when we had a long meeting. Now, it may not be possible to have four-day, five-day meetings. Well, I get very irritated because I see every other international gathering having our kind of retreats. You know, you saw, you saw um, um, uh, Obama with the chaps uh, with the, uh, at the last meeting. They are, they are casual, they, they talk to each other, and they are friendly. But that's not what's happening at the Commonwealth meeting. And I think we should start a campaign against the current, um, the way the meetings are ahead. Good luck to your campaign. <laughs> uh, I, I deplore the fact that the Commonwealth heads meet over so short a period and what I must regard as a, a shrinking period. And when I look back, I have to say, ask, how could we have reached the Lusaka Accord over this kind of meeting, or settle the, the issues that we did in Nassau yeah. without the benefit of that kind of retreat. We couldn't. And you know, playing a round of golf at Glen Eagles <laughs> between Ratumara and Kaunda is enormously important. Uh, Maybe it is the international fashion to work at crisper meetings, but that loses for the Commonwealth its particular character. I'm not impressed by the argument when the EEC meets only for three days or somebody else meets. It is part of the character of the Commonwealth that it meets over a longer period. If the ambience of the meeting is modified in the way I fear it is being modified, we will not be able to produce the results we have produced in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any further questions? Yes, Stuart. Um, Sunny, you, you spoke about um, South Africa and the relations with um, Mrs. Thatcher's government with the Commonwealth and so on, and the Queen's role there. And, um, of course, I think it was in 19, uh, 1986 when this broke open into the public domain in terms of the, the Sunday Times, I think it was, uh, carrying a story um, which the Michael Shea, the press secretary, was fingered for, I think. Um, and relations between uh, the British government then and the Commonwealth did get very, very bad, did they not? Um, how... How accurate do you think that portrayal in the Sunday Times was of the tree, Queen's true feelings? Um, and um, how important, um, especially as the debate moved on, I think Sue was about to tease out from another anecdote about um, how the sanctions debate moved on. How important was the Queen, not just in, in terms of the South African issue, but also in terms of uh, keeping some kind of uh, equitable relationship between Britain uh, and the rest of the Commonwealth? Well, I think what editors understand to be <coughs> the view of the Queen is terribly important to the projection of whatever are their policy views on Commonwealth affairs. And this is where I go back to what I said when you talk about the Queen, you're also talking about the private office. You're talking about the communications from the private office to the press. And, and how good and discreet they are, good in the sense of the confidences that, they, that exist. Yes, there are, are aberrations from time to time, but by and large, that kind of relationship with the press is terribly important and uh, the palace attaches importance to it and I think it influences the attitudes of government. Uh, the British government, when you, when you talk about the British government being unhappy with the Commonwealth, sometimes that meant the British government being unhappy with the Secretary General. Um, you know, there was a, a famous moment when uh, Lord Carrington said at, the, at a press conference 
when he was asked by a reporter uh, the question that we understand that the Commonwealth Secretary General may be a candidate for the post of the United Nations Secretary General. And he is reported to have said, I will be, I will swim the ocean to cast the veto <laughs> against that. <laughs> No, it was a, it was a nice, friendly uh, <laughs> encounter with the foreign secretary. Uh, there was another time when he said at the press conference, I hope Sonny Ramsler remembers which capital he is functioning from. Well, these are things that are uh, an inevitable part of the life of a, uh, of a secretary general who is trying to ensure all the time that the old image of the Commonwealth as a British institution uh, does not exist and that there is no excuse for it uh, to be projected. But you don't think that image will continue if the headship passes to another member of the Royal Bank? And this worries me sick and has done for years. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, what, what, what is the question? Well, uh, what would happen if it passes to another member of the royal family? You know, I, th I think I, I think that question might have been asked when King George VI died. What on earth is going to happen to the head of the Commonwealth role under this young girl? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes, good mm -hmm. Who would have been? I think, Derek, I think Derek's point, though, is, is that um, you said that the, the battle was always for you to try and get rid of the perception that the Commonwealth was a British institution. And I think the point Derek and perhaps others would make is that if the role of chair in office passes to another member of what is essentially the British monarchy, monarchy in Britain and a few other realms, that actually will persist. So the two statements are perhaps contradictory. Yeah, you know, I think the Queen has set a standard. Our father was not head of the Commonwealth for long enough to do that, but she has been. One of the things I deplore a little is the fact that we tend to forget or not to play up the fact that this is the Diamond Jubilee of the Queen as head of the Commonwealth, not just as Queen of England, but this is, you know, 60 years of being head of the Commonwealth. And in that time, she has set a standard. She has set a benchmark, which I think will have to be followed and respected, and will condition whoever comes after her. She'll be well. It's a very interesting point. I mean, she'll be a hard act to follow. You know, whatever happens, of course. Um, and, but but um, and, and last year when Prince William was getting married, the global media descended upon me and there were two questions they asked. One was, isn't it funny that he's marrying a commoner? To which I always replied, actually he's marrying a girl with a university degree and a highly sophisticated young lady, etc. And the other one was, of course now Prince Charles will be passed over, surely, for Prince William to be king. And I said, absolute nonsense, of course he won't be passed over. That's not how we do things in this country. And, um, or in the Commonwealth, and nor should he actually, because he's extremely well trained. <coughs> and, um, he will also become a slightly different man when he becomes king. <coughs> in the same way, in the same way, if you don't believe me, that Mrs. Parker Bowles became a slightly different woman when she married him and became the Duchess of Cornwall. Before that, she was like the, the sort of hated mistress, and now she's the, uh, you know, the supportive wife. And, it's, it, and it was very interesting. It was almost, as, a, as, a, as a, I call myself sometimes a royal hierophant, you would almost tell the moment, the moment that she married him, the press changed their attitude towards her. Uh, I don't know if you believe me or not, that's what they did. Maybe not everybody in the country did, but the press, did they suddenly respect her in a different way? And when Prince Charles becomes king, there will be a kind of a, a drawing of the breath, and he will be able to say an almost amount of praise for the queen. She will be a hard act to follow. Uh, but then they will look at him in a slightly different way. And I think also, it would be, I mean, on the question of Prince William, I think it would be totally wrong for Prince William to follow his extremely experienced grandmother. I think that it would be quite an interesting phase to have 
uh, King Charles, whatever he does, it might be rather fun, actually, uh, for a few years in between the two, and much easier for Prince Philip William to follow his father than his grandmother. Well, if Prince Charles becomes king, I agree with you. <laughs> well, he might not, of course, because he might not, because he might, but the only way he went to become king is if he predeceases his mother. You're a very speculative mother. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can I just add a footnote? Because when uh, Sue asked about the Prince Philip the church, when the, the Commonwealth service began, it was at St. Martin in the Fields in the 60s, and there was a pastor in Essex, his first name was Tony something, you must look him up, because he, he used to um, um, bring people to shout outside, demonstrate, because this, you know, having Hindus and Jews and other people in a, in a, in a church of England. It was the Queen who said, okay, let them come to my church, which was Westminster Abbey. Mm -hmm. And that's how we moved to Westminster Abbey. Right. As, because they can't come and live in As George Wall has uh, narrated in his wonderful round table article. Yeah. And I had not known mm. of this it? very special link between the no. Queen and Westminster. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Wall yeah. Peculiar. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> 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 That, that is the degree. That is her touch. Yes. Okay. I think we should move. We should move at this stage, probably to to drinks. Um, and I think we've, we've probably kept kept um, Sunny and, and, and Hugo here. Long. I think it's been a most wonderful evening. Um, it's been one of my